So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever, whenever you are joining us, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much to, uh, for your coming to this, the fifth of the Maritime Security Challenges Virtual Sessions webinar. Um, so, um, as you may know, uh, we uh, used to have in the before times a uh, biennial in-person maritime security conference where we tried to bring together uh, maritime practitioners, naval officers, academics, the best industry folks to discuss um, the maritime security issues of the day. Unfortunately, as we're living through a once-in-a-century pandemic, uh, we're forced to go online, but uh, uh, it gives us the opportunity to speak with the fantastic scholars and researchers all across the world and we have an absolutely fantastic program for you uh, this morning afternoon evening uh, wherever you are um, first though uh, I must give a great thanks in addition to you our audience for coming out to the people who helped make this possible uh, so great thanks to our sponsors uh, Lockheed Martin General Dynamics the Canadian Defense Review Esprit de Corps and Vanguard and of course, a great thanks to our Maritime Security Challenges partners, the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies and the Navy League of Canada. Uh, today, uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing our moderator, who is uh, Royal Canadian Navy Captain Alex Coyman. Uh, Captain Coyman joined the Royal Canadian Navy as a regular officer training plan cadet in 1988, and after completing his initial naval warfare officer training uh, on board mine sweepers and destroyers, he decided that actually a career beneath the waves uh, was more to his liking. So he has served in Her Majesty's Canadian Submarines, uh, Okanagan, Windsor, Cornerbrook, and Victoria. And he's had the uh, very fascinating opportunity to navigate the Royal Netherlands Navy Submarine Walrus during a three-year exchange to the Netherlands, where he was awarded his Dutch Dolphins. Um, he's also had the great honor of commanding Cornerbrook um, and Victoria um, in the uh, in the late 2000s and uh, early 2010s. And uh, Captain Coyman's shore postings include uh, commanding submarine training. Uh, he was the regional head for Asia Pacific, Latin America, and the Caribbean at the Canadian Joint Operations Command, and the director of Digital Navy at the Naval Staff. So Captain Coyman assumed his current position at Maritime Force Pacific as the Chief of Staff Support in July of 2020, and we're absolutely uh, delighted to have him with us today. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, it's uh, my privilege today to introduce uh, Ms. Darshana Barua, who will enlighten us uh, on the strategic importance of the islands in the Indian Ocean. Uh, before I introduce our, our speaker today, I want to, you know, it is um, it is International Women's Day today, and uh, I just like to point out that we have a, a, a female scholar who's going to who's making quite an impression in her field of studies, and uh, we're very fortunate that there's a uh, very bright, very um, knowledgeable and studious women uh, that that are being you know highlighted uh, in in their fields of, of study so uh, well done and um, you know I will now introduce uh, Darshana. Uh, Darshana Barua is a visiting fellow at the Sasaka Sa Sakawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo where she is working on a book about the significance of strategic islands in the Indian Ocean region. But it was also announced on March 3rd that she is now an associate fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and will be moving to Washington to lead the foundation's Indian Ocean Initiative. Previously, Ms. Barua was the associate director and senior research analyst at Carnegie India, where she led the center's initiative on maritime security and her research included work on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Prior to this, Ms. Barua was a 2016 National Parliamentary Fellow at the Australian Parliament and a visiting fellow at both the Australian National University in Canberra and the Lowy Institute in Sydney, where she focused on India-Australia maritime collaboration. Presently, her primary research focuses are on maritime security in Asia and the role of the Indian Navy in a new security architecture and the strategic implications of China's infrastructure and connectivity projects. Darshana, uh, I want to congratulate you on your impressive new appointment 
uh, which underlines the impact your contributions have made to highlight the importance of this region. Look uh, forward to very much forward to your uh, talk today. And uh, before I sign off and hand over the uh, the microphone to Darshana, I would I would like to request uh, everyone in the audience to to ask questions at any time. Anything that pops up that you would want to know or or questions that you've had for a long time. Uh, just put them in at any time. They will be collated by the webinar staff uh, for the Q&A portion. These webinars, the Q&A portion is, is actually that what, uh, what brings out most of, uh, of the information uh, during these sessions. So please feel free to ask anything and anything that you've always wanted to know about this region. Okay, um, and uh, with that being said, I will now uh, hand it over to Darshana. Um, thank you so much, Captain Kerman, um, as well as uh, in the MSC virtual sessions here today because of the pandemic that uh, uh, that has moved to the virtual, virtual mode. I'm uh, really delighted to be speaking to you all about the Indian Ocean region and its importance in the and the role of the islands in the region. Um, this is this is really the core of the research that I'm doing right now for my book, which is to look at the Indian Ocean region through. Um, what I say is a little bit of a different lens, a new new perspective of looking at the dynamics and the uh, and and the change and the shifting interactions in the Indian Ocean region. Um, the region has, of course, been very important uh, throughout history, but I think today, um, especially in the last couple of decades, it's gone undergone significant changes, and those changes and to reflect the new security environment that we. Uh, today find ourselves in globally, I think requires a new lens to look to understand and look at some of these issues and the lens that I have adopted is uh, to look at it from the importance of the islands and what role islands play in shaping this geopolitical competition that we are seeing in the Indian Ocean region, but also the wider security environment. Um, I thought I'll just start off with some really very basic uh, framework on the Indian Ocean region before moving very specifically onto the um, role of islands. And I would like to interact and have as much Q&A as possible because uh, sometimes when you're deep into your research, I think we tend to also take a few things for granted and might miss out points that would be relevant or of interest to those of you are listening in. So please do feel free to uh, put in your questions and, and I hope to bring out more and share more with you through the, through the interaction after, after the presentation. Um, as I just mentioned, the Indian Ocean geopolitics and the Indian Oceans have undergone significant changes, um, especially since the time of just after the Second World War, as well as from the Cold War period. Um, the bigger powers in the region traditionally have been uh, the United States, uh, France, UK, and, and India, who have traditionally provided security for the region at large. And the way we define, I mean, the Indian Ocean region is essentially from the, uh, as you can see on the map, um, on the from the western coast of uh, Australia to the eastern coast of Africa, and it consists the sub-regions of Persian Gulf, um, the Arabian Sea and of course the islands and goes down to the southern Indian Ocean. The map here reflects uh, the key sea lines of communications that goes through the Indian Ocean region that facilitates trade between the sub-regions of the uh, Indian Ocean and to and then onward to the to the Western Pacific. Um, as in, in coming back to the powers in the Indian Ocean region and, and the players traditionally who have been again US, UK, France and India, um, the in, in after the Cold War, um, after the Cold War, the security has mostly been divided between France and UK in the Western Indian Ocean, where and India taking on more of a role in the Eastern Indian Eastern Indian Ocean. Um, US have definitely been, of course, very much present in the Indian Ocean region, but its priorities have of course, uh, has been more on the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean presence uh, became more of in support of its engagements in the in the Middle East and Afghanistan. So even if there is a carrier group that transits the Indian Ocean region, the American um, exchanges or interactions with smaller islands and, and littorals are not as much as perhaps um, I would say the other players uh, in the region that we see today. 
Of all the players today in the Indian Ocean region, except for India, um, none of these players are actually residents uh, residents of the of the region as such. But it is their um, island territorials that gives them that brings them into the Indian Ocean and makes them Indian Ocean player. Uh, for France, it, it's it's reunion. I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure I'm butchering the pronunciation. Uh, it's reunion island in the southwest Indian Ocean region, which um, brings France right into the middle, uh, right into the Indian Ocean region. Similarly, uh, UK and US have, uh, the UK has uh, British Indian Ocean territory, which is disputed right now with the ICJ, uh, uh, the tribunal uh, on the dispute between UK and US over the Chagos Archipelago. And the US has a base in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, but without these islands, without these uh, territories, whether it's for France, UK, or or the United States, they they wouldn't have a foothold into into the Indian Ocean region or um, or perhaps a stake as much as they do today. Um, as far as sea power goes, um, islands and bases as wayward stations have always been critical in a nation's maritime strategy. Uh, without access to these bases, without access to these facilities, uh, naval facilities, um, a Navy can neither protect nor disrupt uh, sea lines of communications, which are which are important both during peace and times of conflict. And this is the reason I wanted to show this map, which uh, to put it into perspective, the uh, trade and the communication that goes on within the Indian Ocean region and its many sub and and its. Uh, sub-regions as well as it's uh, different between the different continents of it. Uh, the ability, the yellow, this is a map from the uh, Indian Navy's maritime strategy of 2015. The yellow dots are the choke points that the Navy identifies. And of course, the, uh, the big dots are the uh, choke points and then the lines are the lines of communications. Um, the idea of, um, for a Navy, for a, for a nation to uh, from 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 a traditional security point of view, to have access to have power over a region uh, militarily, I think it is it, it was extremely important to be able to first protect its energy lines and its communications between its forces uh, away from its shores, and and which is facilitated by these choke points, as well as to the ability or the um, access over another nation's most likely your um, adversaries uh, lines of communications which is why the Straits of Malacca is considered so vulnerable and so important to Chinese uh, ambitions and presence in the Indian Ocean region and in that of course geography plays a very important role because it is distance distances are so wide in the Indian Ocean region and generally in the maritime space it's the areas are so vast that geography is a big disadvantage to many who wants to be big players in it, but which can be overcome by these islands or the bases, as we have seen through history, through the World War period and, and of course, the Cold War era. Uh, it's essentially because of this, um, because of the importance of the choke points and the importance and the need to kind of uh, protect uh, sea lines of communications and the importance of the ability to disrupt sea lines of communications for a Navy that Islands have again become important and have come back into the geopolitical competition that we are seeing today. Um, as China emerges as the new uh, player in the ocean, at a, a, again at the heart of the competition in the Indian Ocean today is the ability to protect and disrupt the slots. Um, so the concept of sea power, of course, remains the same, but there is a significant difference between um, but, uh, between the Indian Ocean during the Cold War period or the Second World War period and today. Um, at that time, during the Second World War period especially, islands were either colonial bases or outposts. Um, during the Cold War period, uh, nations, a lot of the island nations were still um, emerging, uh, were gaining independence or they were newly independent countries or they were still on the, on the verge of gaining independence and the effort and the focus was really internal, domestic to look at, to uh, bring the population, bring the nation together as a newly independent uh, sovereign nation after years of colonial rule. Um, so, so the agency for islands or, or these nations, newly independent nations or former, or at that point as, as colonies, of course, there was almost no agencies that islands had been able to affect what goes on in the Indian Ocean region, although they were at the center of, uh, for, a na for a maritime power, whether it, was, uh, whether it was the British or the French or the Portuguese during the colonial period for their ability to 
project power across the Indian Ocean region. Um, their access to key littorals, uh, key bases were absolutely important and that importance remains today. The only difference today is that those islands, those, ter those nations, the ter territories are no longer colonial outposts or bases but are sovereign nations with their own set of foreign policy choices, with their own set of economic priorities and strategic concerns. And, and this conversation, this research essentially looks at how would now that affect the geopolitical competition of the Indian Ocean region, considering that the importance of the slots remain, the geography remains the same, the importance to have facilities and bases remains the same, but the islands are today sovereign nations. So the agency changes, and that is the way that I want to look into the Indian Ocean region through the lens of the uh, through these islands and how that affects and why we need to look at the Indian Ocean region um, in, a, in a new security uh, security environment. Um, today, the, these islands will hold, still hold key geographic um, positions across the Indian Ocean. And this is uh, this is a this is a map from a, one of the papers that I did for Carnegie Endowment recently, and this was uh, in in terms of the Indian Navy's 2017 mission-based deployment. But it it puts in perspective the geographic location of the islands and their proximity to the key choke points in the region. Um, the islands are of course, uh, the uh, island nations are Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius, Seychelles, Madagascar and Comoros, but there are also island territories which are part of bigger powers uh, like Cocos Keeling of Australia, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which really are situated near the Straits of Malacca uh, under the under uh, Indian sovereignty. Uh, Reunion, which is French, uh, Chagos Archipelago disputed with uh, with Mal, uh, with uh, sorry Mauritius, but uh, with a base UK and US base there. Um, and there are also islands in the Mozambique Channel, channel which are disputed between Madagascar and uh, Madagascar and France, but which are equally significant. Um, I, for the first time, these islands are um, and their interactions with their security partners, with the economic partners, uh, with the political partners affect and influence great power competition. Or if, because of the geography, how the agency of these islands, of the island nations of the Indian Ocean region, has the power to impact and drive geo geopolitical competition, but also change the security environment. And we have seen that in, in the recent past and how that affects a nation's um, concerns or maritime concerns. Um, in India has been very concerned about Chinese interactions or engagements which, um, with islands such as Sri Lanka, and, uh, island nations of Sri Lanka and Maldives. Similarly, we are seeing more on the Western Indian Ocean with Russia, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, which perhaps are more of a concern for France, uh, UK, uh, France and U UK. Um, so the islands and their interactions and their conversations with with the big up with players, whether it is China, whether it's Russia, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's Turkey, or even whether it's US or France, UK or India, it is driving the interactions between those big up players. So essentially the idea or the concept is that in as far as we talk about the Indian Ocean region today, it is no longer enough to just talk about interactions between the bigger player, bigger players who supposedly provide security across the region, but also interact and engage with the concerns and challenges of this critically located um, island nations with their own, again, own sets of uh, priorities and foreign policy choices that can affect the geopolitical competition in the Indian Ocean today in a way that they could not do neither in the Cold War period or the Second World War era. So in a sense today we are seeing a new dynamic, a new shifting geopolitical landscape in the Indian Ocean region where smaller nations, which otherwise perhaps did not assume that much of an uh, importance in larger nations, calculations or, or, um, um, or thinking on maritime strategy today are being forced to revise and reimagine the way we look at the Indian Ocean region and the way we interact uh, interact with it. Um, one of the areas that, that will become important in, in Indian Ocean geopolitics, essentially most of the Indian Ocean geopolitical competition or the interactions are focused on 
traditional security issues when it is with, whether it's with India, whether it's with US, UK, France, um, and others. But the aspect that is going to come into and is already making a uh, making a huge difference is the non-traditional security issues and the interaction between the non-traditional security issues and its implications on traditional security uh, concerns. Um, Issues of illegal fishing, drug smuggling, uh, drug trafficking, human smuggling, uh, uh, smuggling and human trafficking, um, disasters, uh, cyclones, typhoons, um, disaster uh, management, disaster, search and rescue are all fall on, on, although they all fall under non-traditional security issues, will they have come to assume a much bigger role today because these are the priority concerns for the island nations, again, who are important in the Indian Ocean region. So if as big up players, whether it's US, whether it's even China or the UK or US are interacting with their counterparts in the Indian Ocean region, and, and the concern is traditional security issues, you have to also address these non-traditional security issues because this is, this is what matters. Um, climate change, sustainable development. Uh, we have all we've already seen a lot of them for a lot of nations, even within the Indo-Pacific construct. Blue economy taking on a very prominent role, where we have uh, whether it's India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative or the European Union driving its own initiatives on sustainable development and blue economy. But it's essentially actually the island nations who understands it and who actually have done, I think Seychelles done, has a great initiative on the on blue economy and how to interact with it because the livelihood and existence, it's an existential threat for most of these island nations, whereas for bigger nations, it is a concern, it's an area for collaboration. Uh, we would have to engage more on these issues um, and, and, and look at how best to address it as these are the challenges and concerns of the Indian Ocean region. It's going to be, it's going to get harder and harder to dismiss non-traditional security issues as softer issues to larger um, traditional uh, concerns for the nations, which of course have their place and will remain so. But in the geopolitical competition that we are seeing in the Indian Ocean region today, in the dynamics that we are seeing today, the non-traditional security issues will have to uh, will need equal um, will need as much attention and and a drive to address these issues if not more uh, coming to the concern of the usage of non-traditional security issues for traditional security issues we have the issue of fishing vessels which today are um, assumed or are or there are concerns that fishing vessels from another nation could also be used uh, for surveillance and recon missions or for intelligence and information uh, gathering fishing vessels as also for again to facilitate other non-traditional uh, threats of whether it's maritime terrorism whether it's drugs whether it's human human trafficking uh, so even if the issue of you know illegal fishing or 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 fishing vessels is a concern that perhaps does not rise that high up into uh, a navy's priority or even the nations when they talk about maritime security the the overlap of implications between non-traditional security issues and traditional security issues today um, warrants that we change the way we look at some of these challenges um, uh, and the dynamics, even going back into the issue of traditional security uh, um, on, on the implications between non-traditional security issues and traditional security issues with um, the uh, for China, which is a concern for India, the presence of um, a Chinese a Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean region, which is a concern for um, India, US, um, as well as France. Um, one of the first times I think China deployed its submarines into the Indian Ocean region was in support of its um, mission for its anti-piracy missions of the Horn of Africa. So you did see deployment of a very traditional security asset in support of a non-traditional security issues with is maritime piracy. Um, so engagements and interactions with and on issues of non-traditional security uh, security concerns will become and have become ways to address uh, traditional security issues or issues of concerns, whether it is mapping uh, mapping, whether it is information, whether it's intelligence, or even to gain operational um, uh, to gain op operational strength and knowledge about the uh, about the region and its many players and and the different dynamics in it. Um, um, 
I, I think I'll, I'll end on this note and, and to say that non-traditional security issues, of course, have their own place and traditional security issues, which is what bigger navies uh, engage with each other with. But as far as the Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean region is concerned, unlike um, uh, the, the Western Pacific, which is a much smaller area, which is South China Sea. The Indian Ocean is very vast and it has many sub-regions. Uh, the issues in the eastern coast of Africa would be completely different than the issues on the western coast of Australia. Similarly, the issues on the Persian Gulf would be different, say, on the Bay of Bengal. But together, the players and the interactions between this within the sub-regions carry and have an effect for the larger Indian Ocean region. For instance, um, Russia recently acquired a base for, for a period of 25 years in Sudan, which gives um, uh, Moscow access to the Red Sea and uh, to extension to the Indian Ocean region to Bab al It does not mean that there is no interactions between Russia and the others or in the Eastern Indian Ocean or, the, or, the, or other parts of, uh, of the region. Collaborations and interactions between different players will also define how how these, um, how the security umbrella pans out uh, as we well, as as we start as we continue to discuss the Indo-Pacific uh, region. But while we go back into while as maritime maritime uh, competition, the maritime domain comes back as a key tool for foreign policy engagements. It's become one of the key prior areas for both challenges and cooperation between governments and between navies um i think it is really important to look at the interest the uh interactions and the concerns and challenges of the island nations um if we are really talking about even whether it's from sea power point of view or whether it's from a traditional security point of view uh because geography is important and um if you look at the islands and their locations in the indian ocean region they are better located um for influence interactions and access over over key choke points and um, and sea lines of uh, sea lines of communications, so we will have to break away or make an effort. Countries will have to make an effort in breaking away from uh, looking at smaller nations and uh, and clubbing it under softer security issues or non-traditional security issues, and make an effort to actually understand the interactions between um, non-traditional security issues and security issues, which is whether it's sustainable development, climate change, blue economy, illegal fishing or issues of maritime domain awareness uh, or surveillance and intelligence or ASW and and there are overlapping concerns over it and there has to be a way that we manage these um, issues and address the concerns of the Indian Ocean region and one of the one of the ways one of the starting points would have to be to interact and engage with the island nations the critical island nations of the Indian Ocean to understand the concerns challenges and then to come up with a roadmap on how best to address um, these concerns in the wider Indian Ocean region. Um, I'll stop here and um, hope to have uh, interact uh, to the Q&A session. Uh, Darshana, thank you very much uh, for that um, talk and the explanation. Um, again, I would uh, encourage everyone to send uh, questions in the chat. Um, I will kick it off um, today. Uh, with uh, a question of my own. Um, Darshana, what, what drives countries in this region towards China and Russia, allowing them to establish bases? Is it only the money or is there also uh, political um, or social reasons why they would prefer to have China and Russia as partners rather than uh, Western countries? Thank you. Um, that's that's actually a really interesting question, and it's an important one to understand. I think uh, what has changed in the Indian Ocean region. Um, again, going back to to the starting of my uh, presentation, where I essentially uh, mentioned that Indian Ocean has had uh, a few key players. If after the end of the colonial uh, era, you know, through the Cold War, it's essentially been kind of India, U.S., um, especially after the Cold War, it's India, U.S., U.K. Um, and France, and I think even that it can be narrowed down to France taking a more of a role in the Western Indian Ocean and India on the Eastern Indian Ocean, which means that a lot of the island nations also had very little choice for external uh, partners outside of their primary security players, which was India and France. So if as a small island nation, you only have say one or two key players and you do not have alternatives, and those one or two key players do not really take your concerns and challenges into consideration. Any third alternative is an alternative, right? 
when in 2015, just taking the case of India, right? In 2015, um, when Prime Minister Modi did a tour of the Indian Ocean Island nations, which were Sri Lanka, Mauritius, and Seychelles, it was the first time in 28 to 30 years that a leader from India had gone to these islands. If these islands, if this is so important to India's maritime strategy and thinking, why did it take 30 years for a leader to visit these islands? Because there was no competition. There was no one competing and pushing against India's assumed role of security provider in the region, right? And similar in the Western Indian Ocean with France. France, ha France even today has security cons um, territorial um, disputes with smaller islands in the Indian Ocean region. And those are concerns. Those are concerns for, again, I think it's a, it's a difference in terms of looking at the islands perhaps who were co former colonies but today are sovereign independent nations and their security choices if india as a nation wants to have as many partnerships as possible to address its security concerns so do the island nations it's just the size is different but so the concept of sovereignty remains same for everybody thank you darshana um i have uh, some other questions that came in um, how is the Indian Navy reacting to China's uh, development of ports and related maritime infrastructure in the Indian Ocean, such as in Sri Lanka? And uh, part two to that question, uh, what actual basis has the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy established in the Indian Ocean? Um, let me come to the second question. The only base that China has is in Djibouti, which is a um, naval facility in Djibouti. But again, it's um, it's so does Japan, France, and the US who have bases in Djibouti. But uh, I think the concern for India was that India has um, the China had a long-standing um, policy of no overseas bases, which is to say that the People's Liberation Army or or uh, the Chinese military will not have any bases outside of its shores um, and in 2017 it did set up a military facility in Djibouti so the idea or the concern was that of course that the um, uh, interest the, the interest in China is changing and even when looked at it from a larger maritime ambition that China has which is to be a maritime player it needs to be present in the Indian Ocean region to be able to protect its sea line energy routes coming in from Middle East which essentially go through the Malacca Strait and China will not be able to do that unless it can sustain a presence in the Indian Ocean region. I think it's easier for a Navy to come into a region, but the key goal is to be able to sustain it, to, to be able to address its concern during times of conflict. And that requires facilities that can help you in whether it's support for your support, whether it's times of peace or conflict. And Djibouti is the one that China has right now. And I think it's a matter of time before China has another base come up somewhere in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, the Indian Navy, of course, is very concerned with the with uh, with Chinese um, presence in the Indian Ocean region. When China docked uh, submarines, I think twice in a matter of three months in Sri Lanka, it was a main it was a main concern for uh, India because it was very close to Indian um, uh, Indian waters. Um, but I think the Indian Navy, of course, is comfortable in its position in the Indian Ocean region. It has the, the geography affords India a little bit of an advantage in the region. But from an Indian point of view, China coming into the Indian Ocean region is a cons more of a concern because if because of the disputes on the Northern Territory, India already has a lot of um, um, hostility, especially in the current environment with China on the northern and the eastern border. And if that, for some reason, the competition spills out into the Indian Ocean region as well, then you are essentially facing the same neighbor, same player on both northern and southern um, boundaries. And that does take pressure on the on the Indian Navy. Um, and if I can add here that I know, uh, you know, in the Navy is one of the key players in the Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean region, but the Navy is not very well uh, funded. The Navy gets somewhere between 14 to 17 percent of the defense budget. More than 55 percent goes to the Indian Army. So, um, so there is, so it is a concern. I think uh, if now. Uh, um, conversations or interactions between China and countries in the Indian Ocean region could be political and economic and of course strategic but if there were to another base come up somewhere in the Indian Ocean region it will also be a directly military concern uh, for, uh, uh, for the Indian Navy. 
Yeah, interesting viewpoint uh, that, that what's happening in, on the land border uh, affects their posture uh, at their at the sea border as well. It's uh, it's quite insightful. Um, I have an, another question here from the audience. Um, a litmus test of how Indian Ocean Island states' interests will be upheld amid the long, longer security game is Diego Garcia and its sovereignty. Can you comment on that? I know um, the I, I know that the Chinese were probably looking closely at uh, how uh, the U.S. and the U.K. play out uh, that sovereignty uh, fight. Yeah, I think the issue of Diego Garcia is. Uh is 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 an important one and it will be the one i think that that would really shape how um how things pan out in the indian ocean region there are multiple I, for, from my point of view there are multiple issues that concern uh the issue issue of diego garcia one is you know we've all taken on the concept of rules-based order right whether it's the us whether it's india whether it's uh all of the West, uh, us and its allies you're talking about rules-based order you're talking about the need to uh respect international norms customs and the un but then you have here london and us uh not really respecting the tribunal verdict you know coming out of the tribunal at the icj but these were also the nations who were one of the first to put out a statement in favor of the tribunal uh the arbitration tribunal that was uh delivered in favor of philippines and in in uh, and against China on the issue of the South China Sea. So, of course, island nations are watching it. It's kind of to say that, okay, if I do it, it's fine, but if he does it, it's not, right? If you're really going to mark, drive down the issue of rules-based order, I think it will be important that it is uniform, that you respect the issue or the respect the judgment uh, and the jurisdiction um, of the UN on, on these issues. And the islands are definitely watching uh, watching that. Um, on the issue of the base per se, because the, I think it can be divided. The issue of the sovereignty, which is the Chagos archipelago, and the issue of the base in itself, and the and the important role that UK and US provides actually by being there for the larger Indian Ocean, it's not disputed by anybody. It's not disputed even by Mauritius. The Mauritian Prime Minister has been on record multiple times saying that you know, we do not want to disband the base. The base remains. The base remains. The importance of the base is understood. The importance of U.S. and British forces or its allies being on that base and providing larger security of the Indian Ocean region is understood and it's accepted. The issue is that this was a negotiation that was driven out of a nation which was still under colonial rule. Uh, from the British, it was a negotiation that was done during the time of independence and how proper that was. And the UN has ruled that it was improper to have that negotiation at that point when perhaps uh, London was at the advantage. And I think that can be resolved through a, re through a new negotiation or through a new agreement between Mauritius and UK. This is again my personal view um, that can be resolved because nobody is disputing the relevance or the importance of US forces being on, on Diego Garcia. But it's the issue of sovereignty, and I think that issue of sovereignty, if if bigger nations want their sovereignty to be respected, I think uh, they would also have to show the similar um, judgment uh, toward uh, smaller smaller nations as well. Yeah, I, I think it's a case of uh, do as I say, don't uh, do as I do, and uh, might makes right. Um, the rent might be very high. Uh, that's charged to the U.S. or the U.K. to have their base there. That's the uh, probably uh, the, what's holding back um, those countries from giving sovereignty because who knows uh, what what the rent will be. Absolutely, that is a concern, and I think that will that will remain. And uh, again, it's it's a it's it. I, I think at least because there was. There was tension between London and Delhi on this because India supported Mauritius on the issue, whereas India itself is very much aligned with the U.S. on the issue of China and the possibility of Chinese becoming bigger forces in the Indian Ocean region. But I think somewhere we'll have to make the division between kind of you know decolonization of or leftover conversations from the colonial period and looking at the Indian Ocean strategic um, requirements today. And yeah, it's it's complex. It's a it's a complex issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another uh, question here. Um, you mentioned the importance of non-traditional security issues. How are both 
Indian Ocean Island states and interested powers addressing climate change. When I look at uh, some satellite pictures of some of these islands, uh, there's not a lot between them and the ocean. So I, I think that's a, a pressing question. Absolutely. I think I think the um, I think everybody is of course looking at uh, issues of climate change. Um, you know, everybody recognizes, of course, all the bigger powers. Of course, it's, it's important. But I think the level of the priority ranks different between between the island nations and say the bigger powers. I think for island nations, climate change and sustainable development would be perhaps in the top five security challenges for them. And for bigger powers, it would be yes, you know, it is important, but perhaps not in the top five. Uh, and um, and I think that is the mismatch when we talk about security. When we say, you know, okay, in say you talk about U.S. and uh, U.S. and Maldives collaboration or U.S. and Seychelles collaboration, France and Madagascar, and you say we want to collaborate on issues of maritime security, right? The way we understand security is different from both ends. The way the bigger power is going to understand security is going to be traditional security. The way the the primary concerns for the smaller nations would be non-traditional security issues, right? So there is a mismatch in perception itself when we talk about Indian Ocean security, and that has to be gap. It doesn't mean that you do only one or the other, and I think it has larger concerns, larger implications of non-traditional security issues on traditional security issues, and there has to be a way of address, addressing that. Um, I think that there are a lot of great initiatives that has come up in the last couple of years um, that are aiming to address this, whether it is the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, because tsunamis and natural disaster are a big concern in the Indian Ocean region, and it affects islands much higher than it would do a bigger nation. Um, International Solar Alliance, um, India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, I think these are all aimed at addressing these non-traditional security issues. But again, um, there needs much more discussion and and conversations with the island nations who are faced on a daily basis, on a regular, on on an immediate basis, on how best to uh, address it. So I would say that the level of engagement and the way both sides are addressing these concerns are very different. While they both are saying that yes, it is of it is of importance. Thank you for for that, uh, Darshana. I have, I have a, a question uh, from myself. Um, Canada uh, uses soft power, soft diplomacy uh, very effectively in the Caribbean, uh, helping uh, small islands uh, during disasters, um, hurricanes, earthquakes in Haiti. Um, keeping that in mind, uh, and, and we have great relationships with those, those islands, uh, nations, uh, because of the help uh, we've given them in the past. Keeping that in mind, and, and keeping in mind the huge distance uh, from the Indian Ocean Islands, um, as a truly extra regional actor in the Indian Ocean, what uh, recommendation would you have for Canada to meaningfully engage in the region? I think um, I think you hit the 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 I think the crucial part, which is the distance. You know, the distance is really vast, so it is important. I think it goes to every navy when you're trying to talk about a particular region. What can we do? I think you have to calculate what is possible and. The reason I've stressed so much on the non-traditional security issues in this in this talk was to kind of highlight that maritime security does not necessarily always have to be from a tra traditional security point of view. It's because these are concerns that address the larger security issues of the region. And I think, as you men mentioned, Canada has a lot of experience working with the Caribbean um, islands, but also I think Canada has a lot of experience working in um, in in kind of um, um, vulnerable ecologically vulnerable environment in difficult environments whether it's the arctic you know in different where you have to be very concerned and very conscious of the impact that your activities has on the environment at large on the ecology on 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 kind of uh the oceans and i think that is a big big plus point to draw into the indian ocean region the pacific is much more organized and i think there is the pacific island forum through which the islands of the pacific come together and they together voice their concerns and they say these are the issues that concern us collectively and then you can engage with the region through that forum the indian ocean does not have one forum or an institution that represents the islands you have iora which has membership from australia to iran and south africa to indonesia so there are different political engagements and priorities and social fabric in there then you have indian ocean commission which brings together the five french speaking islands of the indian ocean region and it leaves out 
Sri Lanka and Maldives. So there is also very limited interactions between the islands themselves on what is happening and who's doing what. The concerns are very similar, but I think the interactions are pretty limited. And I think Canada can bring that in terms of its collaborations on maritime security into the Indian Ocean region in borrowing lessons from elsewhere and applying that, whether it's on sustainable development. And I think that's something that Canada can do in building framework for sustainable development models in the Indian Ocean region uh, you, with the within the islands. I think maritime domain awareness usually has, of course, it's a, it's a big and a vague term that encompasses a lot of things, usually traditional security issues, but it also has kind of um, importance or implications for issues such as uh, illegal fishing and the non-traditional part of it, drugs, uh, you know, hu human trafficking, drug smuggling, maritime terrorism, information sharing has become key because of the past uh, region. But you also need training, you need technical expertise to be able to have fusion centers, to be able to translate big sets of data into that one operating picture. And I think there's a lot that from the MDA point of view that Canada can bring into the Indian Ocean region, partner with different countries to, to bring that expertise and knowledge into the region. It does not always have to be a ship. It does not always have to be a big um, deployment um, and exercises to show or do collaborative uh, work on maritime security. And that is the point that I'm trying to drive here, which is to say the maritime security today is very different than maritime security that we saw during the Cold War period or Second World War period. Today is very different. The players are different. The dynamics are different. And even if your concern is traditional security issues, you have to engage on the non-traditional security issues to be able to achieve that and get there simply because of the geography and the importance of the islands and the role that they will come to play in this. Absolutely. Uh, I just have one comment um, based on what you said uh, about these agreements and partnerships. Um, I think of, there's, there's a fishing agreement between the United States and Russia um, uh, in the area of Alaska. Um, and when all diplomacy was shut down, and there was no channels for communication. That was the one link that they still had, the back door, as it were, to be able to communicate and get messages across. Um, I think the same thing counts for countries such as Iran, if they have a partnership with Australia, China and the US when they're do, doing counter piracy. It, it allows for an, a, a venue or a, a, a backdoor, as it were, to continue dialogue and com communications when all the official other ones are, are shut. So I think it's vital that we maintain or that our allies maintain these partnerships, even with countries that, you know, perhaps we don't get along with all that well, but it allows for, you know, a line, a red line of communication um, when no others exist. So that's just a comment. Um, um, okay, I have another question here. Um, uh, it says both India and China have been ramping up their vaccine diplomacy. It's not just money that they're offering, it's now vaccines. Uh, is this also taking place in key Indian Ocean states? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the, so India has, India's Indian Ocean engagement or policy has um, itself undergone significant changes, uh, both both from the naval diplomacy point of view, but also at the political level. And if you've noticed recently, I mean, we have had high level visits to all the Indian Ocean Island nations. We have a lot of new agreements in place. Uh, we also have a specific Indian Ocean desk within the foreign ministry that just looks at the islands from Sri Lanka to Comoros to look at the Indian Ocean as one uh, one area. So when India started rolling out kind of its um, its vaccines um, uh, for the pandemic, first I think India did in terms of offering support in in medical sending medical teams to a lot of the islands in the Indian Ocean region, and that has been across from the African islands to the to the closest one, which is Sri Lanka and Maldives. Um, and the vaccines, and it supplied not just at that point, uh, sent its medical training teams uh, for um, for, um, um, for 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 kind of the pandemic, but also essential medicines, essential food, um, and 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 other I think supplies that India has provided to Maldives to other countries at that time. A lot of the countries also 
the GDP is very much reliant on tourism. When tourism tourism came down to a kind of a standstill because of the pandemic, it was again um, there were there were a lot of um, challenges and issues. I think where India did step up to be able to deliver that. And now with vaccine diplomacy, I think India has delivered vaccines to all of the islands in the Indian Ocean region. And in fact, it has done it before. It has uh, vaccinated its own population, which is which has created another set of uh, domestic issues. But I think definitely, and China has. Um, I don't know the exact number in terms of the number of countries that China has provided uh, uh, vaccines to, but it definitely has. I know uh, uh, it has it has provided to the island nations as well. I think in terms of quantity, I'm not sure how much of it is. I do think India has provided more than China has. The other thing that I think was highlighted by the pandemic is the um, is the is the distance, is the geography that India was able to get to or send teams or support, or even whether it was evacuation or, you know, bring back, um, when, in, when India was bringing back its own students from Wuhan at the outbreak last year to kind of evacuate its citizens, India also brought back uh, citizens from Bangladesh, from Maldives, from Sri Lanka, uh, in, and offered its assistance to be able to do that. But China did not do it in the sense where it sent its aircrafts to um, take back its stranded tourists from say Maldives and Sri Lanka. It did not really offer its own those flights to bring back their nationals who were studying in China. So I think the distance and the way you interact has definitely come um, uh, high, been highlighted during the pandemic and it is something that India definitely has taken advantage of to reconnect and to kind of re uh, establish its uh, ties and engagements with the Indian Ocean region. So vaccine diplomacy most certainly has become a competition uh, or an area for collaboration in the in the Indian Ocean. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for that. Um, another question I have here. Um, do you see any indication that a larger power competition is invigorating a sort of new non-aligned movement in the region? Um, new non-aligned movement. I think all the countries who are part of the non-aligned movement are pretty much a part of it and they are they will remain so i mean india for even when it's doing so much it's collaborating so much with uh, us and its partners and allies uh it's not i don't see it forming alliance a formal alliance in the way that us has with its other partners to be um are coming into and i don't see that happening in the smaller island nations either the, the conversation that i hear is you know like sri lanka says everybody's welcome to sri lanka like you know we want as many partners as we want which is really at the core of non-aligned movement which is to say that i'm not going to choose one over the other yes geography and traditional relationship defines or kind of charts out that there will always be a few countries which will remain your um, you know key players of uh, primary security partners but that does not mean that one is over the other and that you would be able to engage as much as you can and this non-alignment or this kind of engagement as sovereign nations of the islands are taking on is in return kind of starting off a new competition among the bigger powers themselves because everybody's scrambling to have some sort of influence or have some sort of uh, conversation or uh, access to the island nations because of the geography and if one does it the other feels kind of threatened and and that's why it has it has led to this this race for competition without really understanding what is the concern of the smaller islands or what are the challenges that needs to be addressed and what really is up but i think it is changing i do think um that conversation will come it take policy takes time um democracies take even longer time to to come to a conclusion to come to actually do things so it definitely does take time but i do think that is changing and um hopefully conversations like this will also drive the point that we need to look at security issues a little different than we did during uh, the cold war period or especially during the second world war time. absolutely it was all a lot simpler back then it was only two players um uh i have another question here uh Shana, uh, a very a difficult security issue uh, is the introduction of nuclear sea-based uh, weapons such as the uh, Indian Navy uh, nuclear submarine, uh, the INS Ari Hunt. How are they affecting the regional situation there? Is, is that uh, creating 
uh, a new dynamic in the Indian Ocean? Um, not to my knowledge as such in the sense because India is not a new nuclear power. I mean, you know, I think the whole conversation about India going nuclear happened when uh, uh, when it did. And uh, Indian Ocean does have the zone of peace, the concept of zone of peace and free, you know, nuclear free zone, which is to not to have external powers based in nuclear weapons under in the region. But um, but I haven't noticed, or at least I, it hasn't come up in my conversations, because uh, it's not that the smaller island nations have their submarines on, or, or, or are nuclear to have or to feel that competition to have that or feel threatened. I think that conversation will be between, if at all, the, the nuclear element of it would be between, um, I think, India and its competition with China. And I think that is one of the reasons why I suppose when the Chinese submarines uh, docked in Sri Lanka was so much of a concern in India and also a concern when Chinese submarines were deployed for anti-piracy missions, which was to kind of say like, you know, did, do you really require submarines to uh, address uh, pirates which are really using rafts uh, uh, for their their movements? So it was, of course, the, the use of traditional security assets um, for non-traditional security issues is, is that concern. I think that uh, definitely is a concern. But um, other than that, at least amongst the islands and India as such, um, I haven't come across a conversation that has been uh, seen as a threat or kind of a contention issue. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Darshana. Um, OK. Um, well, I would, uh, I would, Darshana, uh, on this International Women's Day, I would uh, like to thank you so much for your insights today. Um, although this region might not be in the headlines day to day, um, uh, such as the South China Sea, I mean, that gets a lot more press. Um, but I believe it's it's vital that we understand what's happening there because. Um, the large powers are, are definitely taking an interest in the region and their sovereignty claims. Uh, it's, it's a lot more complicated than it used to be. And having strategic bases uh, throughout the world is, has been a real asset to the US and the UK. And to lose those potentially uh, would, be, would change the dynamic in a very, very large way. Um, and them being our, you know, some of our closest allies, we have to be aware of what the issues are, and we have to, um, you know, throw our political and and our, you know, and our might behind uh, some of these questions. Uh, so fascinating what you what you told us today. It's it's something that that's not on a lot of people's radars, I guess, because it it is an area of the world that that we're not too familiar with. But certainly, the, um, the 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 area is vital because so much of our trade does go through uh, the sea lanes. And uh, you know, thank you very, very much for today. Very, very much appreciate uh, your talk and your insights. Thank you so much. It was really uh, great to have this interaction. And thank you for the questions. Uh, um, and for everyone listening, and if you have any further questions or anything on any of the research that I do, please do feel free to reach out. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Darshana, and thank you very much, uh, Captain Kuhiman. That was uh, a fantastic hour that we just spent there. Uh, definitely filled in some more gaps in my knowledge, and like all of the best presentations, it just left me with more questions, like um, how are the various island states going to advance and defend their interests? Will we see something more like the Pacific Island Forum start to grow up? Um, will, will there be sort of like a, a unifying factor across the region? So I very much I look forward to this and your your South Asia program that you're leading at Carnegie is going to be a fantastic resource. I uh, deeply look forward to and encourage everyone to go and look um, at that program as you, you get it running and uh, uh, you know sign, shine some more sunshine on this fascinating region for us there, Shana. So uh, thank you very much uh, to both of you. Um, I, I wish you a fantastic uh, morning and evening uh, respectively. Um, 
and I think that will take us to the end of the webinar. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wherever, whenever you are, uh, for joining us for this fifth uh, Maritime Security Challenges virtual um, session. Uh, a video of this webinar will be made available on YouTube. You can uh, search for us in the search bar at uh, MSC, that's Mike Sierra Charlie Conference on YouTube. Um, and of course, thanks very much as always to our fantastic partners for making this happen. Uh, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, uh, the Canadian Defence Review, Esprit de Call, uh, and Vanguard. Uh, of course, our uh, uh, always uh, stalwart uh, partners in the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Centre for Security Studies and the Navy League of Canada. And uh, before I leave you all uh, tonight, I'm very pleased to say that our next webinar will feature U.S. Navy Captain Retired and New York Times bestseller George Galatorici, who will be giving us a fantastic discussion on the naval applications of artificial intelligence. So that should be coming up on April 28th. 2021. So more information will be available on that on our website, msconference.com, uh, as well as our social media. And uh, with that, I wish you fair winds and following seas, ladies and gentlemen, and over to our good friends at Lockheed Martin. At Lockheed Martin, we're on a mission. Your mission. When millions of people are counting on you, you can count on us to build the impossible, to invent the inconceivable, and solve every problem with speed and reliability. Every mission is an expedition of the greatest importance, both to you and to us.